everyone my name is Evie Lupine welcome back to my channel and today I have another video for you all today we have two little news stories to cover we have updates on the army hammer situation which we last talked about like a month maybe two months ago at this point and we also have a brand new story coming out of Australia which is a really interesting intersection between BDSM and public social media and the law that is about something called the House of Catafor. Now neither one of those things are really like big enough to cover in their own video so instead we're going to be discussing them both here together in this video. But firstly I do want to discuss the Army Hammer updates because it's been really quiet for the last couple of weeks. We haven't really seen or heard a whole lot outside of Army just continually being dropped or leaving projects that he's been scheduled out for a long time now. However, there was one big news item that happened recently. On Thursday, March 18th, Effie, who is one of the main accusers against Army Hammer, had a virtual press conference. In this press conference, she described the nature of the relationship as well as the particular allegations and situation that she describes where she alleges that Army Hammer committed rape. Now she was also joined in this press conference by her legal representation Gloria Allred who is really well known for her work with some of the accusers against Harvey Weinstein as well as Chris Brown. In addition, she has also worked with some of the witnesses against people like Bill Cosby. So it certainly seems like Effie was really bringing the big guns, so to speak, when it came to making these allegations. Now, I am going to try and play the video in full of Effie's prepared statement because I think it is really important that you can listen to the particular way that she talks about what happened. However, there's a pretty big possibility that the video would be claimed and removed because of that clip. So if for some reason instead I am giving a dramatic rendition of the testimony, you can also watch it. I will go ahead and leave a link down below that you can follow so that way you can watch it in full and just make sure that I am not taking anything out of context or misspeaking because I do think the context and the way that she delivers the words is really important. But without further ado, let's go ahead and start getting into what exactly it was that Effie said. I met Army Hammer on Facebook in 2016 when I was 20 years old. I fell in love with him instantly. The relationship progressed rapidly and the emotions from both sides became really intense. Looking back, it is now clear to me who was employing manipulation tactics in order to exert control over me until I started to lose myself. He would often test my devotion to him, slightly removing and crossing my boundaries as he became increasingly more violent. He abused me mentally, emotionally, and sexually. On April 24th, 2017, Army Hammer violently raped me for over four hours in Los Angeles during which he repeatedly slapped my head against a wall, bruising my face. He also committed other acts of violence against me, to which I did not consent. For example, he beat my feet with a crop, so they would hurt with every step I took for the next week. During those four hours, I tried to get away, but he wouldn't let me. I thought that he was going to kill me. He then left with no concern for my well-being. I was completely in shock, and I couldn't believe this. What I loved did that to me. I tried so hard to justify his actions, even to the point of responding to him in a way that did not reflect my true feelings. During and since this attack, I have lived in fear of him, and for a long time, I tried to dismiss his actions towards me as a twisted form of love. Now that he no longer has any power over me, I have come to understand that the immense mental hold he held over me was incredibly damaging on many levels. 
His abuse traumatized me to the point where for months I wasn't able to stop crying. I couldn't sleep or I'd have night terrors. I was constantly emotionally distressed and I lost interest in living. I couldn't comprehend and overcome what he had done to me. Over the years since the assault, on many occasions the invasive flashbacks were so exc excruciating that they made me feel there was no way out but to take my own life. I just wanted the pain to stop. <laughs> my hope in speaking out about the abuse I endured at the hands of Army Hammer is that he will be held accountable. I feel immense guilt for not speaking out sooner because I feel that I might have been able to save others from becoming victims. By speaking out today, I hope to prevent others from falling victim to him in the future. I want other survivors of sexual assaults around the world to feel empowered and know that they are heard, believed, understood, and loved. Now, throughout this whole situation, Army Hammer has strongly denied all of the allegations. However, after this press conference was made, there was a response from his legal team, according to the BBC, which said the following. The lawyer said that all of Hammer's relations with the woman had been, quote, completely consensual, discussed and agreed upon in advance, and mutually participatory. Mr. Brettler sent the BBC a screen grab of the text messages, which were not supplied in the article, purported to have been sent by the accuser that contained suggestions of extreme sexual behavior. He said Hammer had responded to the woman, making it clear that he did not want to maintain that type of relationship with her. Quote, her attention-seeking and ill-advised legal bid will only make it more difficult for real victims of sexual violence to get the justice they deserve, the statement added. Following the press conference, Variety was able to confirm with the LAPD that Army Hammer is under investigation and, in fact, has been under investigation since February the 3rd. Now, of course, at this point, everything is still alleged. There has not been any formal charges levied against Army Hammer, and we really don't know at what point in the process this whole thing is at and whether or not this will even go to trial in the first place. Now, personally, I do really strongly think that this should go to court because there are a lot of interesting things that we have seen as more and more allegations have come forward that I think can only really be resolved if this does go through the traditional full legal process. So, of course, the first big thing that comes to mind with Effie's allegations, because do remember, there are more people besides Effie that did experience violence supposedly at the hands of Army Hammer. There were a lot of missing and deleted messages in many of the screenshots that were shared. There were numerous different reasons for why this happened that were presented. Some people said it was because she had blocked ARMY and that the messages on her end would have automatically been deleted. Other people said that she would do this routinely throughout their relationship. She would delete messages that she sent to him as like a form of acting out or because she was mad at him or because she didn't want to talk to him any further and we don't really have any clear picture of exactly what happened and I think in order to fully understand everything it would be really really helpful to have the fully complete picture as much as possible. Now also in regards to the Army Hammer story I remember a lot of you in the original video suggested that I read a book by Army Hammer's aunt Casey Hammer. I think it was called Surviving My Birthright, which apparently had a lot of stories and context for Army Hammer's family life that really made it seem like maybe he didn't fall too far from the tree, so to speak. And I did also listen to some podcast interviews that Casey gave, and whatever you're thinking happened, it's probably not as crazy as what actually happened in reality. Also, shortly after the allegations came out, Julie Michelle did a profile on the whole family, which had some really interesting points in it. Quote, The allegations are an unsurprising development to a long and sordid history with drugs, sex, dysfunction, and betrayal. Many men in the Hammer family have a dark side. Sources close to the family say, one that looms across five consecutive generations. Armand had multiple mistresses, including Martha Kaufman, a mother of two who divorced her husband after meeting Armand, 
Army's great-grandfather. Per the biographer, she drove a car with a homing device, used a tap phone, and submitted to his sexual demands even when they were, quote, extremely humiliating. When Armand died, she learned that he had left her out of his will. Armand's only son and Army's grandfather, Julian, killed a man in 1955 over a gambling debt as well as supposedly making passes against Julian's wife. Casey, Army's aunt, also alleges that Julian was sexually abusive not only to her but to other members of the family as well. After Armand died, the family was thrown into chaos over who would get his estate. As well, other people would later claim that Army's father owned a sex throne among other sordid allegations. So if you want to read the full story about ARMY's family, the link to the profile will be down below. And as well, I will also put a link to Casey's book if you would like to read that to get even more context for ARMY Hammer's family situation. Even just hearing just some brief parts of this story, I think this really highlights how abusive tendencies can be generational in families and how that can be passed on from one family member to the next. However, I think we should be careful when looking at this to not confuse looking at family ties as an excuse for his behavior because that was just how he was raised. And I think regardless of how Army Hammer was raised, we should still hold him accountable because he was an adult. He was an adult when the things that were alleged happened, and I don't think that should be an excuse that gives him full permission to suddenly do whatever he wants simply because of his family background. All right, now moving on to our next story, we also need to discuss the house of Catafor. And this one is really interesting to me because I was aware of the House of Catafor for a long time. Like, I, I swear, I have this memory of on Patreon, like years ago, watching a video from their YouTube channel because the House of Catafor used to have a YouTube channel where they posted videos of their BDSM lifestyle. And in fact, they were trying to do a little bit of crowdfunding to be able to make a reality TV show about their life. They reportedly wanted to be the Kinky Kardashians. Now, that fundraising effort failed spectacularly, and I, I didn't really know what else to think about them. I got kind of mildly bad vibes, but I, I didn't really know if it was just like the way that they did their BDSM was different from me or if there might be something kind of more sinister lurking below the surface. And unfortunately, it seems like everything that happened is more in that latter category. So a few weeks ago, an Australian news outlet called Four Corners released an intensive piece of investigative journalism called Enslaved which details Davis's pursuit of young women just barely skirting the line of the age of consent, bringing those women into the sex trade, which he then exploited financially in order to support his lifestyle, participating in fake group marriages with them, and then finally moving them all to a rural compound where he taught them survival skills, including how to shoot guns, which from the outside certainly sounds like somebody trying to start their own cult. And to me, one of the most egregious elements that they don't even directly address on camera, but you definitely see in the video is not only was he pursuing girls that were so young, they were barely above the age of consent, if that, he was collaring these girls, girls that were girls still in school, not college, not university, but high school or whatever the Australian equivalent to that is. Like they are in their lanes and school uniforms wearing his collar. And I have to say this, the age of consent is not the age of majority. These women were girls. They were, they were underage. They were not adults. And he was collaring them and making them his 24 seven TPE submissives, but usually slaves, which is just, 
you think people are one level and then they go like one level deeper in terms of the just and I just I, I never thought I would see somebody collaring high school girls as a man in his 40s at least but there it is and if you want any other evidence of the nature of his character he also is a valor thief so one of the big things that he would like puff up his chest about was like the fact he was a military veteran turns out he's lied fairly extensively about his service record and the nature of his service because and this will surprise no one i'm sure the reason he left the military was because he was court-martialed and found guilty of drum roll please assault so seems like he has a particular habit about the way that he treats people now at the time that the piece was released they said that there was no ongoing investigation into the house of catafor but pretty much immediately after this came out the police did take action in mid-march they arrested davis as well as searched his entire property and there are some really telling photos of them going through his house and the sheds and the houses that the girl supposedly lived in as well as seizing his electronic devices hopefully to search them for further evidence at a recent hearing, he was also completely denied bail, and the next hearing is expected for some time around mid-May. He is currently facing three charges, which include reducing a person to slavery, intentionally possessing a slave, and causing a person to enter into or remain in servitude. Now, of course, I do think this scenario does raise concerning questions for the BDSM community, particularly for people practicing consensual MSTPE relationships, which is what supposedly Davis thought that he was doing with these women. As many of these people, including Davis, are under the impression that signed contracts somehow give you some form of legal protection and they simply don't you can have them signed in blood and notarized and recorded and whatever else you want but it really doesn't matter at the end of the day a piece of paper is not going to save you from abuse and slavery allegations and i do think that will be an interesting point to discuss in the future how do we distinguish between good consensual MSTPE relationships and bad non-consensual ones which should be considered against the law and how do we make sure that one doesn't get confused legally speaking for the other and I think as far as Australia goes how this case plays out in court if there is a jury how does the jury feel about these things that will all be really telling and interesting to talk about when that does happen. But for now, if you do want to know more in the meantime, I would really highly recommend that you check out the documentary that Four Corners did. Again, it will be down below if you want to check that out, which I highly recommend. It is definitely disturbing to watch at times, so do be aware of that. However, I think it is very, very much worth it if you can tolerate the subject matter. Now, I was planning on doing a more in-depth video about the subject because, like I said, I have been aware of it for a while, and Davis always just gave me this weird vibe that I just was not comfortable with, but I didn't really know why. And there were two different sites that for a long time prior to this investigation were compiling evidence from his social media, from his posts, from his blog, from his submissives and slaves, and they had done a lot of really, really thorough work. Those places were cataphorexposed.com and r slash caddyfake. And literally while I was working to put together the evidence to make a video about this, those things went completely, completely offline. So Catafor Exposed is not around anymore. When you go to that URL, it's just a blank page, essentially. And with r slash caddyfake, 
they had less like original stuff on there, but most of their evidence and timeline and things have either been locked or completely deleted. And I'm sure that they have very good legal reason for doing so. My understanding is that Davis and other members of the house have threatened legal action for people that basically were just compiling their public social media posts. And so they've deleted and removed a lot of things. And of course, now this is very swiftly <laughs> compared to the American justice system going to trial and being investigated. So I think we are going to see a lot of very clear evidence eventually play out in court. And so maybe it's just like not really necessary to have these things anymore. We'll see. But suffice to say, even though I do have some things saved, I'm not going to share them because it, it wouldn't be fair to the websites and the people because they don't have their permission to share the things that they have since deleted for themselves. And of course, since then, Davis, as well as all of the other members of his ongoing harem, have completely erased, deleted, scrubbed all of their social media accounts, so we don't really have the opportunity to find these things again. Who knows if we would ever have the opportunity to do so. And yeah, this is just, it's a, it's a really interesting, concerning, upsetting story just overall from top to bottom. So if you have anything for me, any comments or questions about any of these stories, you can go ahead and leave it down in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this, if you haven't already, please do subscribe. We have videos twice a week about all sorts of kink and BDSM related subjects. And if you do want to make sure to get updates about these stories, as well as other situations I'm covering, such as the Marilyn Manson allegations, being subscribed and having the notification bell turned on is the best way to get those updates and make sure that you don't miss anything. And finally, if you want to support what I do, if you want to help out the channel, the best way to do that is through Patreon. We are currently trying to make our way towards 1,000 patrons. So if you would like to help us in that goal, that would just mean so, so much to me. And if you guys do already support me on Patreon, again, thank you guys so, so much. It does really mean the absolute world to me. And I hope you guys do have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Bye-bye.